Hello and welcome to another episode of the Center for Evolutionary Hologenomics podcast. Today uh, we have a special guest that is not with us here at the center in uh, Denmark. Uh, she's based in uh, Norway, but we work very closely together because we have technology and sometimes we can also uh, travel. Uh, so it's uh, it's always good to have people everywhere and to see them and to catch up with them. So uh, my guest today is uh, Jayla Breely, who is uh, based in Norway. Hi, Jayla. Hi, Anna. Thank you for having me here today. I'm excited to talk to you about my work. It's lovely to have you. So um, would you, for the people who don't know you, uh, just uh, do a little uh, introduction to yourself and, uh, and your background? Uh, sure. Uh, so I'm a postdoc at NTNU in Trondheim in Norway, uh, but I work closely with uh, Morten Lindberg at CEH in Copenhagen. Uh, and we're working on the bacteria of Atlantic salmon uh, and how that um, interacts with the salmon genome uh, and salmon immune system to influence um, the growth of the salmon. Uh, but before that, um, I'm originally from Australia, where I worked, did a PhD in Brisbane, working with viral and bacterial infections in young children. Uh, so quite different. And then um, between Australia and Norway, I did a postdoc in Uppsala in Sweden, working with fossilized, um, fossilized bacteria in the mouths of brown bears and looking at uh, how that changed over the last 200 years of history. So. Yeah, I work with a lot of different things, but the overall um, uniting force has always been sort of bacterial interactions with the host. That is very, very cool. And do you do, or now I know you do um, dry lab work, mm -hmm. so bioinformatics, computer stuff, we'll, we'll get to that. But so in, in your uh, past uh, jobs, was it always kind of bioinformatics based or did you actually also do some uh, wet lab work? I your did. Work? Um, I've never really done field work um, because my bachelor's was all in um, very much sort of human health related, um, but I've done a lot of lab work. So most of my um, PhD was in the lab doing PCR uh, Sanger sequencing, 454 sequencing back in the day when that was a thing. Um, but also I've worked with a lot of culturing of bacteria, culturing of viruses, culturing of mammalian cell lines. Um, so. Yeah, a lot of wet lab stuff, can do it, um, prefer the dry lab stuff. So throughout, um, yeah, in my first postdoc, I was doing a lot of library preparation in the ancient DNA lab, which involved wearing, you know, the full body hazard suits and things. Uh, but this postdoc, I finally managed to get away from the lab and just doing analysis. So I quite like that, but it's good to have, I think, that lab background. Yeah, definitely. You understand the, the, the struggle uh, a little yep. bit more, but it also yep. helps. Uh, I think, you know, people should always work together and have this dialogue because uh, a lot of bioinformaticians do have. Uh, actually, it's it's kind of a common thread. It's like, well, I was doing all this wet lab stuff, but I didn't really like it and I wanted to work in the computer. So I just moved out of the lab. Um, but it, it's good to know how it works in the lab, because then uh, it's easier to not only know the, the experimental design, but if there's something that yeah. you're not sure regarding your data, then you kind of have an idea of how the, the libraries were prepared and so on. Yeah. And also, even if you don't, then you have the baggage to understand and to ask the right questions to the people who did that in the lab. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, I'm really glad I do have a good understanding of all of the, even if I didn't actually do the lab steps myself for the data generation, I understand the steps that were done. Um, I think that's super important for actually interpreting the data and processing it. Yeah, that's that's very, very cool. And so you mentioned parasites and uh, I, I kind of, I, I am familiar with the, with your work and uh, <laughs> that is a little bit uh, what we're going to, I'm going to ask you about today. <laughs> But uh, maybe we can also start uh, with the microbiome uh, mm -hmm. and then, then move into the sort of the, the macro uh, biome because uh, at, the, at the center, we have a lot of people just focusing on the microbiome. And I always, even though we have a lot of people working on what would be the same thing, it's actually mm -hmm. very different projects for in the microbiome exists mm -hmm. in many different places in the body. Absolutely. Um, 
So, and in this case, you work with salmon who is not in the lab. So where does the salmon live and what kind of uh, stuff live in them in terms of microbiome and, and macrobiome? Yeah, um, absolutely. So, um, yeah, as you said, I work with the microbiome uh, and microbiome uh, in salmon, so specifically farmed salmon. Um, and so these salmon are kept in um, their, at least as adults, their um, post smolt. So once they go through the freshwater to saltwater transition, they're kept in the Norwegian fjords um, in sea pens. Um, and so this means that when they're in this environment, they are exposed to sort of the natural sea water somewhat that they would have been um, exposed to in the wild. Um, so rather than being kept in very closed systems on land, um, this means that they can acquire, I guess, a hopefully slightly more natural microbiome than those that are purely raised in um, yeah, uh, land tanks. Um, so I guess most of my work focuses on um, the gut microbiome um, of the salmon, uh, which at least in my so the way I kind of think of it incorporates both uh, bacteria, which we're sort of more used to thinking when people say microbiome, you think of the massive bacterial biomass, uh, particularly in the gut. But it also includes uh, micro eukaryotes like fungi, uh, as well as viruses. Um, and then we kind of shift to what's sometimes referred to as like the macrobiota, which is uh, things like parasitic worms, like helminths. Um, so... Um, yeah, it's not micro because we can't see them without a microscope, but they're still kind of small and living inside a vertebrate host. Um, but that's just uh, specifically within the gut, but you can also have um, the microbiota or microbiome is very specific to other parts of the body as well. So then salmon have their own skin microbiome composition, um, gill microbiome, um, yeah, and so on and so forth. Yeah, that's very, very cool. So it's, uh, I, I like it that so far in all the, the episodes of the podcast, there's always something new and different uh, in each project. So today you you bring us this uh, this notion of macro uh, biome. So uh, if we take it from uh, um, like the, the, the ecology definition, micro is tiny, macro is big. So one you can sort of, you know, in rough terms, one you can see, the other one you can't see with the naked eye more or less. And then biome, it's almost like a little slice of the earth or wherever you are. And then it's the, the environment with all the stuff in it, the climate, the soil, the plants, the animals. And so then we apply it to a, a smaller scale and this would be uh, a little slice of the the cut of the salmon and then we go in a little bit further and we separate it into micro and macro and we have so many things going on uh there so uh i'm anxious to jump into the macro biome but just one question about the micro biome before we get there because this is kind of the the more common uh, thread at uh, at CEH. So it all these things talk to each other and they influence uh, each other. And uh, we do have a few projects on um, health of um, trying to improve improve the, the health of animal uh, production. So I would imagine that this uh, microbiome plays a very important role in in the health of uh, of salmon. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so um, we know from a lot of studies uh, in humans, model animals, uh, but also kind of starting to expand into non-model systems that the microbiome does have an important role in health. Uh, and most of this research has been done in the gut microbiome. Uh, but again, we know that it is uh, likely true of a lot of the other different uh, body sites as well. Uh, so, but at least in the gut microbiome, we know that so the normal bacteria and other uh, microorganisms that are there, they can uh, outcompete potential pathogens that might invade. They are, might be involved in digestion and producing essential metabolites that help the host. Uh, and they're kept in balance with the host immune system um, so that they don't, no particular bacteria gets too out of um, 
yeah, grows too much uh, and things like that. And it's also very likely uh, important for immune system maturation and development um, throughout life as well. So it seems to be super important. And uh, so if you have a sort of normal gut microbiome, then you're happy and healthy. However, um, when uh, the gut microbiome is disturbed, for example, with infection, like with a parasite infection, which we'll talk about um, more detail later, I assume, uh, but also from, for example, antibiotic treatment or even stress or changes in diet. This can all um, sort of disrupt the balance of the microbiome and it leads to what we call dysbiosis. Uh, so that the normal um, functioning of the microbiome is disrupted. So we see potentially an increase in possible pathogens, um, decreases in um, perhaps the um, the healthy microbial functions that are present. So maybe a decrease in the production of important metabolites for the host, uh, and then also dysregulated immune responses. So we could see a suppressed immune response or an over-inflammatory um, over immune response. Uh, so overall, um, gut dysbiosis is associated with an unhappy, sad host. So. Yeah, we, for the people um, listening and not uh, watching on, on YouTube, we love memes. So contrary to popular beliefs, scientists have a great sense of humor and we also love memes. So uh, uh, in the normal uh, gut, we have some happy looking salmon and then we have a, a very sad composition, gastronomic composition of a sushi. Sad salmon is sad. So, but, but this, is, this is the reality. And uh, it, it's great that we are uh, now uh studying and getting more and more data of not only what's there but also what they're doing so that then we can figure out how to uh improve and go from sad sad salmon into happy salmon because um then that uh is is better not only for the production itself for many economic reasons but for the general health and, and happiness of uh, of the salmon and of course then we have less losses uh as well which is overall great but then so this is the microbiome and all the the bacteria and all the things and uh this is kind of the, the most common thread uh in a lot of uh, these chats that i have with people at our center but you have one more uh, bonus in here. So as if it wasn't enough to have all of this stuff going on in the, in the gut of the um, salmon, then you also have, uh, not, not you, the salmon also has <laughs> parasites. Hopefully not you there. <laughs> well, no, we parasites are everywhere. Go. Yes. <laughs> so, and especially if they live in the wild, as, as you mentioned, they're just there and whatever mm -hmm. is in the water, um, yep. then they, they get. So how does one salmon uh, get, um, for example, some some um, intestinal parasites? I, I'm guessing they're tiny. Are they already born or they're eggs? How do they mm -hmm. get into so the salmon? Parasites tend to have quite complex life cycles. So they often go through um, several intermediate hosts before ending up in their sort of final host where they reproduce. Um, and so in the case of, um, for example, the tapeworm that I work with, um, it would appear that um, the eggs are eaten by copepods, which are kind of tiny crustaceans. Crustaceans? Thank you, crustaceans, <laughs> <laughs> that I live in the, um, in the water, in the seawater, um, and then, Sometimes um, the salmon can, at least in the lab, the salmon can directly eat the copepod um, just as part of their normal feeding. Uh, and then, um, sorry, so I should say, so basically the egg that's inside the copepod, it then um, hatches and then matures in the body cavity of the copepod. So it's not in the gut, it actually gets into um, the muscle, basically, or the tissue of the copepod. So then the salmon uh, eats the copepod uh, and then it matures in the salmon gut into an adult um, and then lays eggs and then you know, the salmon excretes those eggs and this is the cycle starts again. Um, but it can also go through a second host. So it could be eaten by a herring or a sprat or some other smaller fish. Um, and then because salmon um, are 
um, do feed on fish, um, they can then prey on these smaller fish and then it kind of gets into the salmon that way. Um, yeah, but essentially the salmon eats it. And, uh, and that's the, I think, the, the way it usually happens for most intestinal um, parasites. Um, that, yeah, so that's even yeah. more important in, in aquaculture where everyone is in close contact that yep. in a way parasites are almost contagious that if, if there's so many fish in, in even though that there's yeah. water moving and if you're so close kind of the more parasites you have then the more parasites everyone keeps getting um, exactly which yeah is not and good they actually um apparently uh, according to some of our aquaculture industry collaborators um just sort of anecdotally uh, to try and decrease the likelihood of the salmon getting these um, tapeworms, they will almost kind of hand feed the salmon when they first go into the seawater pens um, to try and stop them from actually eating the copepods and eating the actual salmon feed they want them to eat because then uh, it also decreases their likelihood of getting these parasites. Um, but as we will see, it doesn't seem to be that effective um, because yes, these copepods are everywhere with the, these parasites uh, and then yeah the closer they are together you just get this system of just more and more parasites more salmon eating the parasites and parasites everywhere <laughs> parasites everywhere <laughs> that that's not a meme that i see on the screen but we can also make it, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it should be <laughs> um and so i guess the tapeworm is your um favorite now because that's what you study but if we would were to open the the gut of a of a salmon would we find a big variety just out of curiosity would we yeah. find a big variety of these worms or mostly would be dominated by um tapeworm do you know um i'm actually not entirely sure i think definitely so the tapeworm does have a noticeable negative effect on the salmon so often um, because they're basically taking nutrients that the salmon needs for itself uh, it can lead to smaller fish uh, but there's also some other studies showing that it can also lead to some behavioral um, problems like altered swimming and things like that so it seems to have a negative effect on the salmon which means that more research is dedicated to actually learning about uh, these tapeworms so I suspect that there would be a diversity of um, different parasites and helminths and probably also um so helminths is just one kind of type of parasite the worms but there's also protozoa um and a whole bunch of other kind of types of parasites um like that would also be potentially in there as well um but i don't actually know if there's been a really good assessment of that um <laughs> Yeah, and of course, I mean, from the salmon aquaculture industry point of view, um, there's also the ectoparasite salmon lice, which feed on the skin, um, and they're a massive problem as well. Um, and we're actually interested in looking into the, uh, researching them and their microbiome as well, um, but we don't have the samples yet, so we're just focusing on the take home for the moment. But so the take home message is it's, it's a very hard life <laughs> being a salmon in the wild. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and so you, you mentioned a couple of things there that I would like to unpackage yeah. before we, we move on. So you mentioned helminths, which basically means, I guess, um, parasitic Par worms? Yes, yeah. Well, I think actually some helminths aren't necessarily parasitic, but uh, many oh. of them are. Worms. And then yeah. the, the, there's like there's many different ways in which you can divide them mm. but uh you can have sort of two big groups right the the flat worms and then yep. the uh, round worms and then yep. within those there's more groups and then finally if anyone is interested in the family tree of the tapeworm then it would be like a flat worm and then assessed within those is that correct that is correct yes uh, yeah so i think um Within the flatworms, you also have nematodes, for example, and not all nematodes are parasitic. You definitely have like the classic C. elegans is, you know, the model organism for some um, evolution biology um, research systems. And then that's, um, that is also a helminth, it's a nematode, it's a flatworm, but it's not, um, yeah, not parasitic, so. Yeah, and you also mentioned uh, ectoparasites. 
So mm. um, for the, the people who want to learn all these cool terms so they can uh, show off to their friends that they learned something new, uh, can you tell us what are endo and ecto parasites? Yeah, of course. Um, so ecto means external. So in this case, an ecto parasite is a parasite that is feeding on the external surface of the host. So uh, usually like the skin, in the case of salmon, it could be the skin or the gills. Um, but it doesn't sort of invade into the host itself. Uh, whereas an endoparasite is um, internal, so it'd be things that do get into, so like the um, intestine, for example, so take one. Um, but could also, I guess, be um, other internal organ systems too, so a blood parasite would also be um, an endoparasite, like malaria. But, like malaria yeah I was thinking yeah. that this is yeah. <laughs> all the the more common ones but at least yeah. people will probably have uh, have heard of, of those so and that mm -hmm. is transmitted by the the mosquito bite the anaphylis yeah. yeah um yeah and so then you also mentioned that uh, you would be interested in the future in looking at the microbiome of the ecto Parasite. So I'm imagining, or do you know, if uh, the uh, tapeworm, which is your favorite endoparasite at the moment, yeah. um, does it also have a microbiome? Uh, that's what we're kind of investigating here. Um, so that was kind of the main goal of this part of the project uh, was to actually, um, yeah, look at the microbiome of the part of the tapeworm itself, and we know from other studies of worms and parasitic worms um, that some do carry some bacteria which may be essential to their function so there's um yeah at least one example of a certain type of Wolbachia bacteria that is essential to a um I think it's a flat worm one of the ones um and it actually is essential for um, their survival so that if you kill um, with antibiotics, that bacteria inside that worm, um, you have a, the worm itself may die or its um, reproduction and the amount of eggs produced by the female rapidly decreases. Um, so it's super important. Um, we also know from some both tapeworms in other systems uh, and other uh, paras uh, parasitic worms that viruses are also, um, they do carry their own viruses. Um, and sometimes these viruses can get into um, the host and actually might trigger an immune system response to the host. So they might not be, the virus might not have evolved to actually infect the host and be pathogenic, but it kind of accidentally causes a pathogenic immune response by the host because the host is like, I've never seen this virus before and panic. So um, we do know that basically, yeah, um, parasites can carry, um, well, parasitic worms can carry um, bacteria and viruses. But what's interesting about the adult tapeworm is that they lack a um, gut. So basically when the tapeworm gets into the salmon intestine, it um, attaches to a particular part quite hot up called the pyrocasia, which is something specific to fish and I probably mispronounced, but anyway. Uh, and then the body of the tapeworm kind of um, then is kind of out in the salmon intestine and is absorbing all this nutrients from the salmon gut. But um, it does this by, no one's really sure how it, exactly how it does it, but it somehow sort of transfers nutrients from the gut across its skin surface or taking them into its body cavity. Um, so it doesn't actually have like a mouth um, or any type of sort of digestive tract is what we would think of. And so because of that, it was often thought that they can't have their own gut microbiome because they don't have a gut. Um, and how would they get them? Can bacteria actually even transfer across this um, surface? Um, yeah, so it was a really interesting question and that's kind of what we wanted to look at um, was whether or not um, these tapeworms themselves actually have, um, yeah, have their own unique bacteria. Yeah, well, Parasites are incredible creatures in terms of evolution. They came up with the craziest strategies. So even though I don't want them on me or in me, um, you got to, you know, from a, from a biologist's perspective, it, it's always so cool to kind of study and think about all these 
crazy strategies that made them such efficient machines with all the things they lack, they somehow managed to be extremely successful. So the, the tapeworm is basically a head, which now I know doesn't really have a mouth. It has, I guess, this part that attaches, latches onto the, yep. uh, the host. And then it's got a neck and then basically a very long body of segments. And uh, now I've learned today that it doesn't have um, intestine, so but it has microbiome in it. And I guess because it comes from external sources, it might pick up something on the way as well. Uh, so mm. it might have something different uh, so that it didn't, it, not everything just came from the host because this parasite has lived before <laughs> yeah. getting to the, it's been places before getting into the. Exactly. Family. Yeah. But what's interesting is that it's always li lived in like the body cavity of its previous host. So again, the body cavity is usually assumed in like fish and things to be sterile because again, there's no nutri real nutrients for the bacteria to live on. Um, so it's not like it's actually in the gut of the um, previous host either. Uh, so it is like an interesting question, like where does, if a tapeworm has a microbiome, where does it come from? Uh, is it sort of, yeah, acquired like as an egg? Is it passed down from the um, parent to the um, egg in a vertical transmission? Is it horizontally acquired from different hosts or the environment along the way? And yeah, so... That, that was, was like a little petri dish of a medium, you know, when you're trying to do the, the experiment with the kids and you give them a petri dish with some LB mediums, like open this and go around your house and see what you get. So mm -hmm. I guess the the, tape, the baby tapeworm and then throughout its life, it's kind of like that yep. as well. <laughs> yeah, it seems that way. Um, yeah, at least that's what current research seems to suggest. Um, yeah, and then I just want to pick up on something else you said, which is, uh, I didn't know, but my the comparison that came to my mind, because I studied mm -hmm. marine biology, is the um, like coral reefs and this little mm -hmm. algae that lives in them, that if the, uh, with bleaching and all this stuff, if, if the, in pollution, if the algae is not there, then the, the coral kind of starts dying. And I didn't know that um, there was uh, also a, a specific bacteria that is essential for the, the this parasite to be alive, which thinking about humans and health and the, the health of, uh, of um, the salmon in this case and therapy, then that could be a, a great target, right? Because when we <clears throat> develop therapies, sometimes we target the problem directly, or sometimes we target whatever feeds the problem or allows its survival in, in more um, indirect ways. Yeah, yeah. And um, in this that particular example, uh, they've definitely, researchers looking into targeting this specific bacteria as a treatment for the parasite um, because it seems to be so essential. Um, and yeah, we're very interested in seeing if, um, we don't really have the data for that right now, but certainly if in um, the salmon tapeworm, like if we did find something that was seemed to have a similar important role, that would be um, a really exciting finding uh, and could have, yeah, a lot of implications for novel tapeworm treatments so yeah and so I'm assuming I'm thinking about cancer now and like what the body recognizes self and not self and what kind of therapies because you want to destroy the bad thing but not your own thing mm. so this bacteria it's neat it's not it doesn't exist in in the salmon or does it um okay so for the the one I was talking like the example I was talking about that's actually um a completely different system it's not salmon um Maybe even I'd have to check if it's humans. Um, I think it is actually. It's like uh, I can't remember what the um oh it's okay. Sorry, it's yeah. Just, as a scientist anyway. interviewing or having a chat with another yeah. scientist, we always have more questions and more questions. Yeah. So I think it just means that uh, it, this is a very very interesting subject. And for the yeah, people listening. Um, who are not scientists, this is what we do, okay? We have a hypothesis, then we go to the lab, we do experiments, 
we prove or disprove the hypothesis and then we have 500 more questions and then when we don't know something we just go and read a paper or google it until we know the answer which is what jayla was just prepared to do so yep. <laughs> this is normal life everyone who is not a scientist <laughs> absolutely yeah well unfortunately i can't quite remember um the details of that paper right now um but i believe in that case uh it seems that the bacteria was quite different from anything that was in the host. Uh, in our case, um, a lot of the bacteria we find in our tapeworm samples are somewhat related to bacteria we find in the salmon. So it, we would need a very targeted uh, method to uh, really take out the exact bacteria you wanted um, and not destroy the salmon like good bacteria at the same time. So it's yeah. definitely. Um, a long way off, I think, at the moment, but it's, um, it definitely needs a lot more research, but it's definitely an exciting thing to think about. Yeah, yeah. And, and also, again, for, for the people who don't necessarily work in science, this is kind of how it works. There's so many scientists in the world doing research that sometimes seems like it's almost the same. Sometimes it seems like it's completely different or the same in different systems, different organisms, different conditions. Uh, and then we just read a lot and we collaborate a lot and we discuss a lot because then we sometimes see that if something happens in a system then we can apply to our own or if somebody uh, with the um, example that you mentioned uh, just figured out that this bacteria is essential for the parasite then you can try and see if it's there or not in your system as well and then if some mechanism of action of some drug works for that, then it might or might not uh, work for yours. Um, but yeah, just, just for people to kind of have a, a notion that there's a lot of information out there and there's a lot of things we don't know, but there's also a lot of complementary things that a lot of different people um, do know and then helps the, the, the big picture uh, come together. Yeah, I mean, I feel like it's very rare that someone gets a completely novel idea, right? It's always like you hear about different things that people are doing and then see how you can apply it in your system where it hasn't been done before or taking kind of, yeah, multiple things from multiple different places and then combining it into something new and building upon um, old uh, previous research. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's also a, a matter of, of scale and, and perspective, right? Because there's a big picture. And then there's the salmon, and then there's the gut and the microbiome. And then there's also the um, some um, macrobiome in there. And then they have their own microbiome. So it's almost like inception. So you can zoom out, but you can also zoom in. Yeah, exactly. And um, I've one um, kind of way of thinking about this whole parasite microbiome. Um, thing, concept, uh, is by using sort of the nested um, matryoshka doll metaphor so that, you know, the host is kind of the outer doll. Um, so that would be like the salmon, for example. Uh, and then you might have a parasite like a tapeworm inside it. Uh, it's like sort of the second nested one. You also have the host bacteria. Uh, then inside the parasite, you then have bacteria and viruses that are related to that parasite. So that's another layer inside the nested doll. Uh, and then we also actually have viruses that specifically infect bacteria and they're called bacteriophage or phage viruses. Uh, and so then you can have kind of the virus, the bacteria, the viruses of bacteria attacking the um, bacteria inside the parasite, which is inside the host. Um, yeah, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, many, many layers. It's very, very nested. Yeah, that is that is very cool. And uh, just for the people who are listening, um, we're JL actually uh, has uh, a picture here of some artwork by Meredith Brindley, uh, which was in the plus pathogens um, in a paper there. And I just love how far we've come with um, data representation and data presentation in general. We've come from, obviously, in the past, we had a lot smaller data sets and less complex data sets. But at some point, we went from 
when we finally were able to make something out of that, out of, uh, of that, we usually in the beginning, we ended up with just, you know, scatter plots or bar plots, which are fine. And they do tell scientists what we need to know. But then when you share it with the world and people are supposed to relate <laughs> with what's happening and be interested, they look at this plot and like, oh, okay, that one is bigger, that is smaller. It's a rectangle, it's not interesting. And now data visualization is a thing and it tells a story and it's visually appealing. So the, this um, image uh, with the, the Matryoshka dolls uh, and it's exactly as Jayla just, uh, just explained with the bigger one and then all the little ones inside. Uh, and then, so we are looking at um, beautiful dolls and then each one uh, has uh, the representation of either being the host or the worm, or the virus, or the bacteria. So they are very, very pretty, and they communicate the, the scientific uh, information very well. So I, I really, really love that. And I would assume in this Matryoshka system, then even though we have these compartments, they very much communicate with each other and influence and depend on each other, right? So how, how does this all work if we think about just the let's say the three compartments, the, the fish, the parasite, and then the microbiomes in, inside of each one of them. Yeah, absolutely. So I think this is still very much uh, things we don't know a lot about yet. I mean, we know the host microbiome communicates with the host immune system, and there's lots of research supporting that. But in terms of now adding the parasite and the parasite's microbiome in there, um, and so we're not even sure in most cases how the parasite microbiome um, affects the parasite itself. So, I mean, I gave that one example that showed that a specific bacteria was essential to the parasite, um, but at least in terms of um, like tapeworms, um, we know very little about whether or not any of the other bacteria um, that might be present might be important or not and how it interacts with the parasite itself. Uh, we then have, um, interaction, possible interactions between the parasite microbiome and the host microbiome. Uh, so if the parasite micro microbes can actually get outside of the parasite and into the host microbiome um, that that parasite is surrounded by, um, can those different bacteria and viruses interact with the components in the host microbiome? And what does that do to the system? Um, because we know bacteria in particular, they do outcompete each other. They can um, produce molecules that kills off certain competitors of theirs, or they can help each other by producing essential um, metabolites that they need um, that another bacteria can use to survive. Um, so there's all sorts of possible interactions there. And then if the parasite microbiome uh, can get outside of the parasite, they are then free, I guess, to interact with the host immune system. Um, and then, as I think I mentioned earlier, um, this means that the host immune system might be exposed to bacteria and viruses that it hasn't really evolved to cope with. Um, so then there could be sort of unexpected um, interactions there as well. Yeah, this is this is very, very cool. So many questions to, to be answered, but definitely there, there are advantages in, in kind of zooming in and out and looking at things to the smallest scale you can so that you can see what's happening there and then you zoom out a little bit to see how that interacts with the next thing and then how the whole thing uh, comes together um, as, a, as a big picture which is which is great and look somehow I, I just came through my mind looking at all this so there's a lot of data <laughs> here and uh, apart from data visualization, another thing I really, really like is um, efficiency and collaboration and optimal um, use of, of resources. So I'm, I'm wondering, for this project of yours, was it written as a project, uh, let's look at this, uh, the parasites specifically in their microbiome, or was this another project? And then a lot of people kind of hopped in and said, okay, but I would also like to study this and that, and I have expertise in this other thing. So let's just maximize the, the resources and make a big study where we can just, everyone studies their thing 
but instead of you know having a million fish we have yeah. 500 or whatever smaller number that everyone yeah. gets something out of exactly so um this project is using samples from the hollow fish project which is a collaboration with ntnu um CEH in Copenhagen and also a commercial aquaculture company, Leroy. Um, and so the salmon come from uh, these uh, seawater farms in Bergen in Norway. Um, and the main purpose was actually to look at how the salmon gut microbiome um, interacts with the host immune system to influence how big or small the salmon grow and just general health, um, but not specifically focused on tapeworm. Um, and actually, it was apparently a um, conference, you know, back in the day when we could actually have in-person conferences. Um, it was a conference dinner that um, my um, PI, Morton, um, was sitting next to a um, parasitologist, um, Nolwyn Deli, um, and they got talking about tapeworm and salmon and how they found a large amount of tapeworm in these salmon. And she was like, oh, have you looked at the parasite microbiome? Because that's sort of her area in um, other systems. So it was kind of, you know, one of those classic, you know, just having a chat at a conference that then led to this collaboration. Um, so that's really cool. Um, but yeah, so in this Holy Fish project, um, other people, because I didn't have to do the field work for this, thankfully, um, went and sampled around 460 salmon um, at these sea farm, at this one sea farm, um, and, you know, took a whole bunch of measurements. So weighed the salmon, um, gutted them, took all the different tissue samples, including gut content. Um, and because they found a lot of tapeworm present in the salmon, they also took uh, tape, whole tapeworm from the individuals and stored them. Um, yeah, so it was a huge effort. Um, yeah, very scientists like, what is this? Oh, let me take a sample. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, but also, this is something we are missing a little bit. So hopefully we can go back to normality um soon which is the it is so important to have these um either coffee breaks or social dinners at, at a conference or even in your own institution with your colleagues either within your group or with other groups and then you come up with these ideas just by discussing and sometimes it's people who have the same knowledge sometimes it's people who have completely different knowledge and then one plus one comes together and beautiful science <laughs> and interesting science uh, is born. So that is, uh, that's super great. So you didn't do the sampling here, but do you ever, are you allowed out of the basement or uh, <laughs> you never go and do any field work anymore? You just uh, all the data in the end. I did actually, um, we have a number of salmon projects happening um, and one of them, Hollow Food, um, has a large amount of, trials are uh, happening in a spot in northern Norway and they had to last year um, normally a whole bunch of people would come from CEH and sample um, but because of the border closures with um, COVID uh, suddenly we had to scramble to find a bunch of people who are already in Norway who could sample so um, I got to go along to one of those um, sampling sessions so I actually have you know gutted salmon and taken um, skin uh, gut content samples so I kind of know somewhat what was done here uh thankfully these salmon were actually kept in lang tanks so you didn't then so they don't have tapeworm because there's no source for the tapeworm to get in um so we didn't have the same experience of opening the salmon and just seeing um the gut <laughs> just full of tapeworm um which i mean they're not harmful for humans so it's absolutely no problem but it still is a little bit disconcerting to see <laughs> And I tried not to show too many of those photos in the um, video version of this um, the slides. Um, yeah, but so I at least have actually done uh, sampling in Norway, um, and that was that was fun. But yeah, you got out of your natural environment. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> also very beautiful. I mean, all of Norway is beautiful, and it was on the fjord, and like I'm actually on an island in the fjord, and it was stunning. That does sound uh, very nice. And so do you have any any results? Because this is the thing that we all want to know, right? We, we start with the hypothesis and the subject, and that's really great. But really, what's happening in there? <laughs> yep. Yeah. So if we dive into the results, um, 
we found, so as I said, we sampled um, 463 fish uh, in this project and over 80% had at least one tapeworm present in the gut of the salmon. So super high um, tapeworm levels. Uh, and we did use a semi-quantitative index to quantify how much tapeworm we found. And so um, we went from a score of zero, meaning no tapeworm in the salmon gut, uh, up to three, uh, being kind of so much tapeworm that it's actually disrupting gut function. Uh, and for those of you um, seeing the video, I actually do have a photo showing the salmon gut that's just full of tapeworm. Um, not taken from these, the photo wasn't taken from these fish, um, but from uh, one that's available in a book. But apparently it did look like this. So it's just, yeah, lots and lots of tapeworm. Um, yeah, and for the people um, just uh, listening to the audio version, just, you know, think spaghetti. And yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Yep. <laughs> there were not too many fish with that level. Um, I think because it probably does actually kill them um, and really reduces their nutrients uptake. Um, but we found a lot of fish that had a couple of tapeworm or enough, many, many tapeworm, but uh, not enough to actually disrupt normal gut function. Um, and then when we looked at um, the weight of the fish, um, and compared that to the gutted, um, the tapeworm index, we did find that fish without tapeworm tended to be heavier uh, and fish that were really heavily uh, parasitized by tapeworm um, were, low, uh, were lighter. Um, so it does seem to be having some effect on the um, nutrients and growth of the salmon, which, as we said before, um, the aquaculture industry cares about from a um, production point of view, uh, but also, of course, it affects fish welfare as well. So we also care about it for actually having healthier fish. Yes, happy, healthy animals, mm -hmm. and people, and the planet in general sounds like exactly. a, uh, a good idea. Yeah. Um, and so uh, every time I talk to bioinformaticians, you guys make it sound like so easy. It's like, oh, well, you know, we had all this data and now here's the juice. And thank you. Thank you very much for that, by, for not making it overly complicated. Here's the result they are smaller or, you know, it's yellow or whatever. But uh, these are huge, huge data sets and complex mm -hmm. data sets with, uh, with a lot. Can you just uh, kind of, um, in simple terms, kind of take us through the, the process of, you know, having the samples and then doing your magic and then you come up with these simple graphs that actually uh, have a, a lot of, of data um, in them. Yeah, um, so for um, the, I guess, generation of um, the sequencing data, um, essentially, um, so I guess for this particular project, we had over 400 fish, um, but we only used a subset of 30 fish for the tapeworm project, um, just because it was a kind of a side pilot project. Uh, so in this case, um, after we get the samples back into the lab, um, next step is to do DNA extractions on those samples. So for the tapeworm study, uh, we took um, scrapes of the gut mucosa of the salmon. Um, so this is kind of the lining of the gut rather than the kind of mushed up digested stuff that's in the middle. It's on the kind of the sides. Um, and so then, um, we did a DNA extraction on, and I say we, I again didn't actually do this, but my colleagues did a DNA extraction on those. Uh, and then we also took the whole tapeworm uh, and washed it to try and remove any surface gut bacteria from the salmon that may just stuck to the tapeworm. Uh, and then again, basically just mushed the tapeworm up uh, and did a DNA extraction on that. Uh, and then all of the Pretty much all of the data we generate is sequencing based. So it's either DNA or RNA sequencing. So we did, um, and these, um, in the case of DNA, so these DNA uh, sequencing, sig yeah. these DNA um, fragments need to be prepared to be able to um, then sequence them. So we have to add adapters so that the sequencing machine actually recognizes that it's a DNA fragment that should be sequenced. So we call that library preparation or library builds. So then, um, samples went through that uh, and the technique we were using to look at the bacteria present in the salmon and the tapeworm uh, is called metabarcoding. So in this strategy um, 
we use a particular bacterial gene called the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. And this is present in all bacteria. And parts of the gene is almost identical in sequence in all bacteria. So we can design primers to sort of specifically pull out this gene. Uh, but other parts of this gene are very specific to certain species or genera or other taxonomic levels of the bacteria, um, which means that we can then, um, by comparing all of the sequences that we get back from the sequencing machine, we can then um, assign each DNA sequence to a particular um, bacteria taxa that's um, taxon that's present in this. Uh, and so from that, we can then get the composition of the gut microbiota. And it's called barcoding because it kind of like the 16S gene acts as like a barcode to give you that identification. Yep, that is very cool. And uh, again, that's going to be something that's going to be recurring uh, in, in um, a lot of the, the work that uh, we, we do here at, at the center. So we either use um, 16S, which is kind of more targeted because we design primers for those sequences, or uh, if you're feeling a bit more rich, <laughs> or a lot more rich <laughs> yep. and you want to know exactly everything there is in there. So then we can have a, a less targeted approach, which is we still prepare at libraries, um, but then we just use more general things where we basically sequence absolutely everything that there is in there. And then our brilliant bioinformaticians. And then that is like in, basically we chop up everything and then <laughs> you guys put everything together again <laughs> and align it and try to to figure it out um mm -hmm. so actually in our um previous podcast episode so if you haven't watched it or listened to it stay until the end of this one then go watch or listen to the other one but uh we were also talking uh, a little bit about uh, meta barcoding so um, yeah, but it was completely different. We were talking about the microbiome of um, the, the pouch of, of marsupials, uh, which is a very cool system as well. So I, I really love having these chats with different people because even though it's all microbiome, it's so diverse and, and it's, it's, it has so many functions and the, yeah, it's, it's very, very cool. But so after doing all this, it's it's the curious um, biologist in me. Uh, so after doing all this work, do we have any results? So after figuring all this out, do we know who's there? Kind of. We we do we do. Uh, so I guess to focus first on, um, we had um, samples from each of the different levels of tapeworm infection. So from zero, like the index of zero, so no tapeworm through to the index of three. So, you know, complete spaghetti ball of tapeworm. Uh, so we first just compared um, the composition of the salmon gut um, bacteria between these um, four levels. Uh, and um, essentially we found that the um, salmon gut was dominated by a particular type of bacteria called mycoplasma, which we also know for other studies of salmon, uh, both in our group and in other groups. It is um, present in Atlantic salmon, and it seems to have some type of positive, good health associated role in the salmon. Um, but what we found was that the um, composition, uh, the abundance of this mycoplasma uh, did decrease um, as the tapeworm index increased. So salmon with more tapeworm had less mycoplasma. And instead we see a sort of takeover by other bacteria such as Photobacterium or Olivbryobacterium. And these increase in abundance as the level of tapeworm increases. Uh, and these bacteria have in other fish uh, and in other places in the salmon found have been found to be pathogenic. So they seem to be associated with skin disease, for example, on the skin of the salmon. Um, and so they are possibly pathogenic in the gut of the salmon, but we don't have um, good, it, we can't say for sure that they are. Um, but it does seem to suggest that, you know, when we have a healthy salmon without tapeworm, we see mostly mycoplasma dominated. Um, and then as we kind of get more and more tapeworm, we see a takeover of other species. Uh, so that suggests that gut dysbiosis is happening so that um, the sort of normal functioning of the gut microbiome is being disrupted. Um, and that is kind of what we expect. We know that this happens in other parasite systems as well, like um, 
yeah, like even in humans, sometimes certain gut parasites can disrupt the microbiome. Um, but it's kind of good to confirm that. Yeah, definitely. And we come almost full circle now to where we started with the with this notion that uh, there are certain uh, types of bacteria that are um, associated with health and some that are associated with um, dysbiosis or, or disease. And uh, so having bacteria is good for you. We People sometimes forget this. So it's what kind of bacteria you have and the ratio. And then it seems that somehow either they then um, they might have a, a weaker immune system or something else. But uh, definitely somehow it allows things that would normally not be there or be there in very low levels to kind of survive better and, and take over uh, compared to the good good bacteria. So that's that's a very interesting finding and um, it's sad times for the salmon, definitely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, but hopefully then uh, after um, and people think sometimes also like, oh, you did this study. So now you have, you know, all the answers. Well, this is something very, very nice and interesting to build on to eventually get there. Um, and but at least it's telling us that uh, what is happening even if we don't know the exact mechanism. Um, and then you also looked at the um, microbiome of the tapeworm. I'm very curious to uh, know if it's different and, and in, in what way it is. Yeah. Different. Is it numbers? Is it species? How is it compared to the, so the, the tapeworm microbiome compared to the host microbiome? Yeah, so I mean, firstly, we did find um, a microbiome inside the tapeworm. So that was just the Check. first thought was like, yes, <laughs> that is correct. Um, so secondly, we found that the tapeworm microbiome was dominated again by mycoplasma. Uh, so the same genus of bacteria that we also found in the salmon gut. But we found other species of bacteria um, that are also quite closely related to mycoplasma, like ureplasma. Um, that were only present in the tapeworm endomicrobiome and not in the salmon gut. Um, and so we were curious because it is the same genus, but within the same genus, um, you can have very different species of bacteria and some of them can cause disease in some instances and some are completely like very, very beneficial. Um, and so there's a huge range. Uh, and some of our... Um, with this barcoding, metabarcoding approach, um, you don't always get species level resolution, but you can have data that suggests sort of that they are different groups of um, like species within a genus that could be associated um, with, sorry, basically we had reason to suspect that um, we were seeing different species or strains of bacteria of mycoplasma in the tapeworm compared to the salmon. Um, but we couldn't uh, say for sure with our 16S data. Uh, so then we did um, shotgun metagenomic sequencing, um, which is what Anna was explaining before, where we sequence everything that's present in the sample. Uh, and then we used a whole bunch of fancy bioinformatics to reconstruct whole bacterial genomes. Uh, and we were able to get um, whole bacterial genomes of uh, the mycoplasma that's present in salmon uh, and also of those that are present in the tapeworm. And so then we took these whole genomes and we compared them to all of the mycoplasma um, genomes that exist uh, in public databases. So this includes uh, human pathogens like mycoplasma pneumoniae. Um, and when we kind of put them into a phylogenetic tree and see how related they all are to each other, we found that the salmon mycoplasma kind of forms one particular branch of the tree and that one of the tapeworm mycoplasma genomes is related, but still different enough to be classed as a different species. Um, so kind of confirming that it is in fact, it's not just the um, tape, um, the salmon, the same salmon sort of strain that is coming from the salmon getting into the tapeworm and then just colonizing the tapeworm. We also found a second uh, tapeworm mycoplasma genome that was present at lower abundance in the tapeworm. Uh, and it was in a completely different part of the mycoplasma tree. 
uh, and it's actually clustering quite closely with a um, mycoplasma species called mycoplasma mobile, uh, and it's actually a known pathogen of fish gills. Um, so we don't know if this particular tapeworm mycoplasma is pathogenic to salmon, but it is related to one that is. So it did kind of, that's one of our outstanding questions is, uh, could this actually be pathogenic to the salmon if it was able to get into the salmon gut? Um, but yeah, it seems to suggest that we are actually seeing a distinct um, microbiome that's associated with the tapeworm and it is unique compared and different from the salmon. So. That is so cool. And again, we are back with having found one answer, sort of, and now we have a million more uh, questions to, to answer once you start opening the, I don't want to say pun, can of worms, but, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, and, and then, of course, I can't help by, but looking and seeing that there's a pattern between the, the, the two that in terms of the, the associations and like how closely you have the, the salmon group and the tapeworm group and then the other tapeworm group and the salmon group uh, as well. Mm -hmm. Maybe it doesn't mean anything, but, you know, scientists look for patterns and you yeah. can present this to me like this. I'm like, hmm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, we're, it's definitely is interesting. Um, and I mean, the taxonomy of mycoplasma isn't particularly well resolved either. Um, there's been a lot of focus just on a couple of human pathogens and like that's it. So, and like the whole, you know, we know that mycoplasma is present in many different fish, but we have very few whole genome sequences from um yeah, from these, from fish, from different, um, you know, both freshwater, saltwater, et cetera. So, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of diversity we don't know about, which also makes it more difficult to kind of put our particular mycoplasma genomes in context um, because we've less to compare to. Um, but, yeah, it's definitely is interesting. And it's interesting that it's kind of related but different. Um, yeah. Yeah, so this is, this is, very very interesting and uh what is your next step from here now that you have kind of the the basics and uh i kind of i was very excited to know like what is there so then you touched a very important point which is okay we found microbiome in the table because we didn't know and, and sometimes people kind of overlook that you know step mm -hmm. by step first of all is it there check okay now we can move on to the next question yeah yeah definitely so yeah. now you, you have answers and what are your your main questions like for the foreseeable future that you would like to work on and then figure out yeah um i think so i guess i've got kind of multiple different things one is simply i guess what is the role of the host microbiome in um tapeworm like infection and colonization and recovery. So we know that when we have a good sort of mycoplasma dominated uh, microbiome, we have a happy, healthy salmon. And then at some point, some type of dysbiosis occurs that's associated with the presence of the tapeworm. And that has, leads to a sad, unhappy salmon, uh, unhealthy salmon. But we don't know um, whether or not um, the, um, is it the microbiome is actually preventing? Um, so, is a dominant like does the mycoplasma dominated microbiome in the salmon actually uh, protect against tapeworm infection? And then does dysbiosis occur for some other reason? And then the tapeworm takes advantage of that to then colonize, or is it that it's actually the act of colonizing the salmon that the tapeworm triggers this gut dysbiosis? Um, so that's kind of one kind of area. And then secondly, of course, we have the fact that the tapeworm actually has a endomicrobiome. And what does that mean? Um, what are all the roles there? Um, so I guess, you know, because we are working in aquapults, right, and to also put things in the perspective of how can we apply this information or what kind of future research projects could be developed to try and find applications for this. Uh, so one way is, um, can we somehow boost the host microbiome uh, to either prevent tapeworm infection or to help recover so that if we treat for tapeworm, because there are treatments available um, 
there's increasing antiparasitic drug resistance against them. So people, farmers try not to use them, but they do exist. Um, but then we still are left with the problem of this disrupted gut microbiome. So maybe we could use something like probiotics or prebiotics in the feed to try and um, get a sort of healthy microbiome recovery happening instead. Um, another option is to try and take out the um, potential pathogens, um, also bad bacteria that are associated with fake worm infection. Um, so for example, um, using like standard therapeutics like antibiotics or perhaps phage therapy, which is when you actually use specific viruses that um, infect bacteria to take out very sp uh, targeted bacteria. Um, so that's kind of one other cool option that could be used to sort of try and um, improve uh, the host microbiome on that side of things. Uh, another question I have is, can microbes actually be transferred between the, um, the tapeworm endo cavity uh, and the salmon gut? Um, and if this happens, um, can we see interactions between um, the tapeworm microbes and the host microbes or the tapeworm microbes and the host immune system? Uh, and that's kind of what we were talking about at the beginning as well. Um, and maybe it's actually the tapeworm microbes that are getting through the tegument and into the salmon gut that are actually triggering this dysbiosis more than the tapeworm itself. I mean, we don't know. Um, and we do have some preliminary results that do suggest that some type of transfer is possible, um, but it's sort of, yeah, we're still looking into it. Um, then, I mean, another, I guess, important aspect is that if bacteria can get transferred from the tapeworm into the host, they could also act as a vector carrying um, pathogens or as a um, Trojan horse. So basically, you know, the pathogen can sneak in under the cover of the tapeworm and then get into the salmon host and cause you know, havoc. Um, and again, there are some examples in other systems um, where this can occur. Um, but hasn't been shown in the salmon take one yet. Um, and that's kind of related to the whole, you know, we found that one of these um, mycoplasma was related to a salmon pathogen of the gills. So if this tapeworm also had virulence factors that could cause problems to the salmon, then um, yeah, that could pose a possible risk to the salmon. Uh, and then finally, I'm also quite interested in the tapeworm biology itself. Um, so what are the roles of these mycoplasma? In the tapeworm survival reproduction, maybe we could use this information to actually take out uh, essential bacteria or uh, symbionts um, which are associated with the tapeworm and use that as a novel tapeworm therapy. Um, but I'm also just interested in that from a more basic biology point of view. And like as we were discussing earlier, where does the tapeworm get its microbes from? Is it from horizontal transfer um, or uh, is it? sorry, a vertical transfer from the parent or is it from the environment? Um, yeah, so there's lots of really interesting questions, I think. But um, yeah, I think for me, at least the main take home is that, you know, microbes are important and I think we need to take them more into account when studying parasite infections. So yeah, lots of interesting questions. Like definitely lots of different areas. To go. Definitely lots and lots. And, and it's amazing how the world and, and nature is so complex and has so many things. And uh, as scientists, the more we know, the less we know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, and I also like your approach of uh, here's 500 questions. Which one would you like? Yes. Yep. <laughs> Take your pick. <laughs> yeah, so, so many. Uh, interesting and, and different angles and of course the, the applications uh, as well and then you can have um, obviously all of this is, is for knowledge but sometimes you have basic science and then from that you also get the applied um, science and it can be from so many angles and it can um, have stakeholders from so many different uh, fields and, and in industries and uh, definitely um, farming is, is a huge industry and uh, healthy and happy animals um, are, are a, a big thing. So that's, that's a, a great aim to have. Plus, just out of sheer curiosity as well, uh, figuring out how all this works and how all these little 
pieces of the, of the puzzle come together. Yeah, I really, I quite like the salmon as a model system because it kind of, you know, we can look into basic biology questions and basic research in that, but it's kind of nice that the results might actually also help make more sustainable aquaculture at the same time. Um, and yeah, both from a fish welfare point of view, uh, sustainability, because less production loss, uh, less waste point of view. Also, like the a number of populations of wild salmon in Norway are now red listed and are threatened um, because of, um, basically, most likely because of uh, aquaculture activities and particularly disease spillovers, where you have these outbreaks that occur in a uh, aquaculture facility, um, and then that gets into the wild populations and causes problems. So um, yeah, I think it's quite important from a number of different um, aspects. And it's also, yeah, just like a nice system to do cool biology. It is definitely, you You have a, a lot of work ahead of you, lots mm -hmm. and lots to do. You will not be bored. No, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> uh, thank you so, so much. This was so, so interesting and, and enlightening. And um, do you have any final words or message or something I didn't ask that uh, you would like to share with the world? And I failed at asking. <laughs> no, no, uh, no, this has been a really fun, really fun conversation. Uh, thank you for yeah, having me on here and taking the time to chat about this. Um, and yeah, again, microbes, microbes are important, particularly in parasite infections. And um, yeah. We need to make more memes and t-shirts. I think that's uh, yes, yes, that should be a priority. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> can never have too many memes in science. So no, one we we cannot. It helps us cope with the uh, with the <laughs> busy days. Let's call them busy. Mm. Uh, <laughs> so uh, Jayla Freely, uh, coming to us via Zoom from Norway. Thank you so, so much. Um, it was a, a very great episode. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's been really fun. <laughs>